So what are we going to do today? Today's session agenda really is about assessment. Now, um, someone mentioned uh, as we were waiting for people to come in before nine, that um, you've had to move all your assessments online. What are the implications? What are the implications for the long term? Okay, so now you're scrambling around trying to come up with um, a strategy that would be uh, useful for now, but surely this is something you need to experiment with going into the future. If you are online learning, you don't really want to pull everyone uh, to a venue for, for invigilated exams every year, or do you? I don't know. That's Maybe you can tell me soon. So that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to have a look at the pros and the cons of online assessment. And there are some fantastic pros and there are some diabolical cons. Okay, so we will talk about those briefly. We will look at diagnostic and formative assessment. I don't want you to think of assessment only as summative. All right, so um, can we not use assessment in other ways uh, to improve the, uh, the course delivery and uh, to assess where the students are uh, are being successful uh, during the process, and then we're also going to I'm going to ask you to rethink summative assessment, and I'm going to be quite scathing about the traditional exam model, uh, which I think is diabolical anyway, and now it's even more diabolical that we're now trying to emulate that model online. But anyway, don't get me started before I get there. All right. We are going to have a breakout room discussion today. I'm going to get you to um, uh, get into little teams and discuss an issue. And then I'm going to make a big push for authentic assessment and the use of constructive alignment. Now, those of you with an education background will go, oh, here we go. These are core stuff. And for some of you who go, oh, yeah, I vaguely remember, or, oh, I don't know about that, then it'll be an introduction. Okay. And that's our little program. It is going to probably push on to 90 minutes. So um, keep, yourself, keep yourself comfortable. And remember, if you have any issues, raise them in the chat or raise your hands. And um, Darren will uh, assist you immediately and then flag something if I need to raise it to the group in general. By now, you should know me, all right? I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with me today and next week. Next week, we're going to be looking at different technologies that we can use for online learning. Uh, and then you'll be relieved to know that Neil will be available for the, uh, the seventh and the eighth ones. So he will take over and you don't have to put up with me. Okay. And right, here we go. So, online assessment. Assessment can really be broken into three pieces, all right? The thing that we know of assessment tends to be summative assessment. We use summative assessment normally after the learning process has happened, and that's when we want to kind of measure to what extent has learning happened, all right? And the idea then is uh, we've come up with historically a whole load of different ways to do summative assessment, of which the most popular and most inefficient is the examination, especially as it has become to manifest itself in this modern age, where you sit everyone in a room, you give them a paper, you get someone to walk up and down and check they're not cheating, and then they have a timed period where they're going to try and memorize everything and put it on a piece of paper. And then there's a laborious session of marketing, marking and then processing all the marks. But for some reason, the world, never mind developing Africa, the world has become obsessed with the exam. And yet the exam is a particularly poor way of doing summative assessment. All right, so keep that in mind. Then the other type of, of assessment is formative. Now, formative normally happens during the learning process. So the idea is you can do testing for to help people understand to what extent they have assimilated the knowledge or acquired the skills or whatever. So formative tends to be like little tests, uh, quizzes, little opportunities for people to gauge their understanding uh, during the learning process. It's really a teaching and learning aid rather than a traditional test. All right, so that's formative. 
And then the other area where we can break up assessment is into diagnostic assessment. So basically, this is more, it can happen before or during, um, whereby we try and monitor to what extent um, students uh, either have prior knowledge that they need to do the course or that they are, have acquired the various skills and competencies and knowledge um, uh, that we have already covered. So yes, that's diagnostic. And I would make a case that for online assessment, diagnostic can be done online beautifully. Okay, diagnostic uh, works exceptionally well uh, online. Formative assessment can be done brilliantly online. Okay, and um, there are so many sexy little apps and fun little things to use. Um, that formative assessment uh, really, really makes sense online. Summative assessment. Hmm. I would say that it is possible, and I'm going to show you some of the technologies that have been set up for uh, to do uh, online summative assessment. But I would say at the moment, compared to the traditional approach, uh, which is very high security, uh, requires very high levels of security, it is still problematic. The problem with online assessment is just as we get clever in terms of identifying who's writing the exam, for example, the students get even cleverer about how to use technology to circumvent those security measures. All right, so keep that in mind. Hmm, you seem to have someone drilling next door. All right, um, so diagnostic informative, what's on offer? So let me just show you. Uh, right, so uh, to get some idea about what we can advise you in terms of using diagnostic and formative assessment, I've taken a page from UCT's Center for, Mm, I've forgotten, CILT, uh, Center for something, Learning and Teaching, Innov Innovation, Center for Innovation, Learning and Teaching. Um, and uh, some of you who remember the oh, wisdom will remember uh, that our UCT uh, uh, colleagues in our PHEA project where we first met many years ago came from this department. Okay, so um, the... Monica. Uh, Monica and um, oh, I've forgotten. Uh, Monica and Cheryl. Do you remember Cheryl? So um, Tony, they, Tony and Tony. Yes, they all come from the Center for Innovation, Learning, and Teaching. Oh, there it is. It's written right on the page. Okay, and um, they obviously advise UCT staff on how to do online assessments amongst all the other things to do online. And this is um, a little OER that they have released and they kind of try and advise the, the staff what to do. So for, they say for assessment, if you just wanna do short answer questions or multiple choice, or all those machine markable type of things, then they have set up a whole little tests and quizzes tools. You can use Google Forms, but then they do advise. Uh, the Vula tests, that's their Moodle, okay? They use, I think it's Sakai, and uh, they call their LMS the Vula platform. They say any of the LMS tests and quizzes and tools will minimize your marking burden, and that's true. It takes a while to set up your, your tests uh, and your um, questions on the LMS, but then because it's machine markable, then all the processing of the, the marks and the statistics and the grades is all done for you. So it really can save you time uh, and your admin load. If you use Google Forms, you will have to record the marks and manage submissions manually. So I don't know how many of you are playing around with Google Forms. It's really good fun. It's free and it's very easy and it's, yeah, it's quite cool. All right. So, um, that's one way of doing a little test. If you don't want to do it in the LMS, you can use Google Forms. But as CILT points out to the UCT staff, um, then there's a bit of manual 
transferring of the data across all the results into the LMS. Where, and you guys are obviously going to want to save all your data inside your Moodle LMS. Uh, multiple choice questions can be used to provide quick feedback, but they require time to write. The interesting thing about a good multiple choice question is that you also have to give feedback on wrong answers. So you really, it sounds easy to uh, do them, but a good, well-designed multiple choice question uh, has many components to it. It takes a while to set up. That's why you tend to like to reuse your multiple choice questions. So once you've created it, you should put it in your question bank and then you can uh, reuse them. Carefully constructed multiple choice questions encourage application of concepts to scenarios. So they say, they, and what I was saying earlier when we were doing course design, that context is very important. And so an arbitrary conceptual or abstract multiple choice question is kind of useless unless you are also t are asking them to tie it to some application, to some context. All right, then they advise that if you want demonstration and verbal presentation, so where previously you could get them into a room and you could get them to uh, either talk to you or give a little presentation or some role play or something, that's kind of a bit harder now to do it online, but you can, all right? Video and attachments to assignments. So one of the things we've been encouraging people to do recently is if you want that type of assessment where they have to role play or present or something, and you want to be able to see from the way that they talk and how comfortable they feel with the with the materials, then get them to video themselves, all right? And then they submit the little video file. And everyone has a video camera these days. Well, just about everyone. Your phone is a brilliant video camera, all right? So um, students to video and submit as an attachment. So then they can upload it in your Moodle as an attachment or as an assignment. Uh, and uh, put it up. They also use a Dropbox where students can drop things into a Dropbox um, to, uh, for that type of formative, formative assessment. If you want them to write long answers, well, then that's easy, okay? You can get just get them to do it in Word or PowerPoint and then they upload the file, okay? So um, you would use the assignments tool in Moodle. And therefore, your essays, your reports, your projects. Lecturer to consider a draft submission and turn it in. All right. So at UCT, they also have um, this plugin for their LMS. And I know Moodle has it as well, if you want. Um, it's called Turn It In. And if you're, you are very heavy on term papers and you want to be able to sh make sure that they didn't just download it from somewhere on the internet and then submit it as their own, Turn It In is very good at tracking down the, uh, the origins of various paragraph sentences, et cetera. They, it can actually tell you to what percentage of the paper uh, was a, a direct reference from materials online. So that's called turn it in. So you might want to consider that. Calculation, students to take a photograph and submit as an attachment to Vula. Now we, um, uh, we are uh, supporting the African Economic Research Consortium They've got a master's program on agricultural economics. And this is one of their issues they have at the moment. Uh, this year, they couldn't meet in Pretoria. This year, they had to stay at home in all their various countries. And then uh, they're working out now how to do assessment online. And one of the problems is they quite a lot of statistics involved. So they need to be able to demonstrate the workings of how they arrived at various um, solutions. So what they're doing is they're taking photographs with their, um, with their phones and then submitting the working along with the final uh, answer uh, through the Moodle. Uh, drawings and graphics, same idea. Uh, students can either convert their diagrams into a PDF or use a photograph and then submit it that way. So there are many different ways of doing what we used to do uh, 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 in terms of formative assessment uh, online. But the really good fun thing now is that there are just so many little apps which make this much more fun than the previous slide seemed to indicate. All right, and I've just put a few up here. We played with Kahoot when we were playing with these Creative Commons licenses. Do you remember that? Two sessions back, I called up Kahoot and then you had uh, 15 or 
17 of you actually uh, did the test and there are others of you were watching. So uh, that's a fun way of uh, doing formative assessment, but it's not the only one. So if you thought Kahoot was a bit too juvenile, okay, not professional enough for ISCED, there's another one very similar uh, called Quizzes, which is much more serious looking, but still colorful and fun, all right? Um, one that is getting a lot of attention at the moment because it really is quite sophisticated is so Socrative, Socrative, okay. Uh, this one provides quite a lot of um, diagnostic data. Once you complete, it really does give you a lot of data about uh, what happened and what went down during that test. And so a lot of the educators are liking it because of the diagnostic component uh, to it. Again, so it kind of mixes the diagnostics and the formative together to provide you with, with evidence about how things are progressing in terms of the learning. And then Padlet, uh, a little bit different, this one. This is more a, a collaborative venture where students can share a whole load of resources, um, pictures and um, uh, short little text pieces, etc. And then they can um, uh, make little clusters of content uh, and then it can be marked as well. So that's another different way of handling uh, some of the formative assessment. And then don't forget your LMS tools. Doesn't matter which platform you're on, you guys are on Moodle, but they all really have now very sophisticated um, testing tools. So you've got your assignment tool, you've got your quiz tool, you've got uh, various other, uh, even your forum now, you can mark the contributions and so on. So there are a whole load of opportunities to collect uh, data about formative assessment. Okay, so keep those all in mind. I'm not gonna go through them. I think you guys know them already. Okay, which brings us to the boogie man, the, the elephant in the room, okay? And that is summative assessment. And I've got big red blaring graphic here saying online exam security is improving, but it is still problematic, okay? If you are trying to emulate exam conditions in the traditional exam venue, you're on a hiding to nowhere because even though there's a lot of stuff out there to help you secure it there are numerous other ways to get around it all right but then it it i want to beg the question why would you want to recreate the terrible exam environment in the first place it was a particularly poor way of determining where the learning had happened it was highly stressful for both the students and for uh, the markers and the invigilators and the whole educational establishment when you like melts down whenever it was exam period why would you want to do that when one it's super inefficient and two highly stressful but anyway so how could you do it so i've got a few ideas here about um what you can do to try and emulate that environment. Number one is uh, using proctoring or invigilation software. Okay, so basically it's turning your cam on and watching the person write, even though they're in a remote environment. Okay, so you basically watch to see, is that person writing the person who is registered for the course? And two, are they doing anything weird? And if they are, then we can close them down. All right, um, so there's like a flow diagram of what how this proctoring software works. First of all, the first phase is to make sure that the remote candidate is logged in in a, in a secure browser. And the secure browser doesn't allow other pop-up browsers to open. It means they can't go and search Google. Um, they more or less are trapped inside one browser window. And obviously that's where the exam appears. Okay, the remote user shows an identity card and the system also captures a photo of the user. So they have to take a picture of their ID, they take a picture of the person as they appeared on the morning that they wrote the exam, boom. Then the proctor sitting somewhere else, because the proctor is not where they are obviously, verifies the card and the candidate. And if they're happy, then they let them into the live exam, right? The, the person's cam turns on, and then they are monitored continuously at every stage of writing or typing the exam. 
All right. The proctor can initiate live chat with the candidate. Um, and you can say, oh, what are you doing now? I, are you on your phone? Oh, that is not allowed. And so on. Okay. So all that type of shenanigans. I'm like, it seems ridiculous to me. And then uh, screen activities. There's a recording of everything they did. Exam administration can view streaming live and recording at a later point in time. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Okay. So if you really want to go that route, there's plenty of software out there that you can do that. And on the right hand side, there are like these five steps that you would need to go through to make sure that your online exam is secure. You must have made sure that you have set up secure browsers on all of their machines, that you have the remote proctoring software initiated and that your proctors are trained and that they know what they're doing and that they have confidence to call people out if they see strange things happen. That the data between the um, student's laptop uh, and the um, the institutional server is encrypted so that no one else can access it uh, through hacking. That there is audit locking. We know about when people logged in, when they logged out, when they did which question and in which order and all that type of thing. So we want to see exactly the process. And then IP-based authorization and authentication. And that way we know that they haven't swapped onto someone else's machine, that they are using the IP address of the device that they um, have uh, authorized to write the exam, et cetera, et cetera. And that sounds all very thorough, but you just have to look at this next screen. Oh, okay, I, uh, we'll come to that. Um, are universities doing this? Yes. Can you believe it? They want to go down this horrendous route. But uh, even UNISA uh, is now, um, in the, I forget the date of this one, but it was very recent uh, this year sometime um that they do have a they, they don't want to change their assessment strategy they're still going to go for the exams they've got a 1.3 million uh, candidates to examine uh and they are going to go with this type of proctoring tool okay to me it just lacks any type of creativity but anyway okay and if anyone has creativity, it's the students. And they are already investigating ways to get around all of these issues uh, and so on. So some of them are extremely low tech. So here we have uh, this, this education institution thought they were very clever and they put, uh, they separated their student, that was COVID. So they all had to be separated anyway. So they put them in these little cubicles of this building, which was a dormitory. And that way they thought they were all isolated. But their friends and their family just climbed up the outside and then told them all the answers through the window. There you go. <laughs> Don't overthink it. All right. But, okay, you might say, well, that's not going to happen for us. But even here, here's a TikTok uh, uh, post about how to get past um, your online examination. So, yes, uh, the IP was... Uh, authenticated, and it was a secure line, et cetera, et cetera. But what the students were doing was they were then using a, tel uh, a cable to put the, the monitor up on the television screen, and then their friends were sitting behind them so they couldn't be seen on the cam, and then they could see the questions on the television screen, and then they would text the answers to the girl on her phone so that she could see, they could see her phones next to the to the thing and then she could type in the answers so the cam wouldn't even pick up the phone there <laughs> so i mean oh, these kids can get around these things so um uh full marks for in innovation and uh, zero marks for ethics all right okay so you could you could see my bias my bias is very much against trying to emulate online summative assessment as we've done it traditionally all right, but I want to know what is your opinion. Okay, so we're going to use our breakout room now, and I want to know to to what extent is ISCED married to the traditional exam, uh, even if we have to do it online in the coming months. All right, so let me get the breakout rooms working. First of all, any questions before I send you off into the breakout rooms?
I see we've got a few things in the. In yeah, the... there's uh, there's just a few comments in that on the on the chat, Andrew, just about the importance of pre-tests and then the videos and quizzes, and then just um, just regarding with acid whether they're using the security measures. I think is that the question. Okay, I see Lee's got a good idea. Nice comment. Uh, and I said, are you using the security measurements? I don't know. Maybe we can find out in a minute. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to go into your breakout rooms and we can find out more about what the vision is for online exams. Uh, cool. Let's get the breakout rooms working. All right. Any other questions? Please put them in the chat. Uh, Darren will flag me if, if it's something we need to share. But I'm about to put you into groups of... Let's have a look. How many have we got so far? We have today 23. So let's put five, five is 25. Let's make five rooms. That will put you in groups of five and fours. I'm going to assign you automatically. All right, let's see what you've got now. So before you go in, let me just make sure you are clear what you are discussing. Um, I want to know, when you come back in five minutes, you've got five minutes to discuss. I want to know, what role do you feel is there is for the traditional examination? And by that, I mean an invigilated, right on your own, um, uh, closed book exam. All right. And um, is there a future for this? Or do you think it's something that you guys need to rethink? All right. You, okay. You clear? All right. You have. The time is now. Uh, 22.10, so you have five minutes. At quarter to 10, I'm going to break you out of your rooms, okay? If you have any problems getting in, let us know. But here we go. Look for the little link into your room. Here, if, if you want to have a quick look, I don't know if you can see on the screen, but these are the groups according to, according to Zoom. And I'm going to now open all the rooms. Right, look out for your little invite, and in you go. You've got five minutes. To what extent are we married to the traditional examination for online testing? Morning, everyone. I agree with uh, Professor Isidro. The rules are very traditional. But I think that we have to do some effort to conscientize our uh, education uh, in high to understand that in, in open education it's possible to have mechanisms to control and to have equality. So we have to prepare to have this quality and to show for the for the community that it's possible to start online with the quality. I think we have a big responsibility in this uh, process because we are the first one in, in Mozambique using online education. Thank you. Very um, useful. What, else, what, did, what did other groups discuss? What was the feeling of other groups? Hello there. Hello. Yes. Um, I, I'm not so sure we'll be able to summarize what we discussed because to some extent we agree to disagree. Okay. <laughs> um, there are some merits and also some shortfalls on, uh, on, on these systems. Um, talking about the traditional uh, 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 examination uh, kind of setup in which we have a student and an invigilator, and the uh, same applies to the computer, right? With the exam and the camera that basically works as kind of an invigilator. There's always cheating there, and um, there's no there's, there's no way to, to, to get away from that. 
But uh, even other alternatives of uh, assessment, there, there's also uh, uh, ways students will find, the students will always find some way, some, some way to cheat, uh, one way or, or, or the other. So, yeah, we agree that uh, the traditional uh, uh, arrangements can be a little bit uh, outdated and they may not uh, uh, to what we are actually trying to assess the student. Are we trying to assess what he learned or what he did not learn? And all sorts of questions that can be asked about uh, uh, these examinations. So we, we are kind of divided in my group. That's the that's the honest uh, that's the honest question. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, we should do away with the, with, the, with these traditional kind of examinations. But uh, I also uh, I see the, the merits of uh, an invigilator and things like that because cheating is real and it will happen for quite a long time. So that's basically the position. Nice. Okay. All right. Another group. What 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 was the discussion like? To what extent are you married to a, to the exam? Yeah. I, I, I was in a, in a group with uh, Lorenzo and uh, Majibi, and we discussed that uh, the final exam uh, currently in Mozambique is uh, is a regulatory issue. Mm -hmm. final, uh, the final invigilated exam is by regulation expected to be done uh, at university. So we will we'll be stuck with the exam up until the authorities are convinced that you can do away with it. But we have also agreed that uh, within our institution, we can reduce the weight of the final exam mm -hmm. to make it 50-50. Uh, the, the, the formative and uh, and other assessment uh, becomes fifty percent, and the final exam, which is invigilated, becomes fifty percent. We also noted that we need to use all the security uh, mechanisms possible to make the final exam as secure as possible, in spite of the fact that uh, there may be some cheating. So that's what we agreed in our group. All right. Now, remember, you guys also had the regulatory thing. You needed a library. And then so you put boxes of photocopied textbooks in each of the different centers, remember? <laughs> so um, your job is to be the provocateur to, to um, make government rethink some of these very bizarre requirements. So I would say, yeah, see yourselves as the disruptors. You need, but you've got to come up with a with an alternative. You see, so um, another group mentioned that they want to experiment and keep trying out different ways and different things. I think that's, that's a very healthy attitude. So in some ways, you are married to the exam because of government regulations. But as Wisdom's pointed out, there are ways around reducing the, the weight of those exams and um, looking at other ways to get a more meaningful summative assessment. So nice. What any other views from the other groups? Yes, my group is uh, Florencia and the Karen. Where a lot of things were were we, we discussed it is the same that um, uh, other groups say. But uh, the first thing is that if we were uh, that in traditional is done. Uh, experience said with the, said that we're wasting a lot of money to 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 making exams because uh, we were using a uh, lot of papers, uh, photocopies, and uh, and uh, what I can say, even the, the system of of copying the exams to center of examination for uh, for marking, it was easy to make cheating too. If someone was changing the numbers of the guy which wrote the exam and put the number for another one. Yeah, this was the, the biggest problem. But now, if we move up for uh, that new system, we can reduce 
on, on the beginning, you can reduce the shipping because the, the, the people don't, the, the student doesn't know which kind of uh, how they can shipping at first. But uh, during the time which uh, we when we are doing this kind of exam, the student will be studying how to ship. You know because they'll uh, upgrade their uh, their capacity to ship. Mm. But what you can do, we have to, uh, on during this time, we have to secure how to can uh, do better to avoid that, that, that cheating. And other things, we have to bring for the position of uh, a group of uh, machacha. We, I said, must convince the government that on online uh, learning, the exam must be on the same way. But we have to secure that it's not possible to be 90, maybe 95% or 99% is not possible, it cannot be possible to shit. If you are convinced that is there is all security for do that to do that, maybe they can accept. Because now I said is the one all doing uh, online uh, uh, okay, online system learning, you know. Uh, but after COVID, I hope that there will be more situation doing the same, and you lose the same system to for learning. And then when we combine uh, and then the, prove the government that we can uh, secure that the shitting will be minimal, minimal because you cannot say it will be zero. There is no system which can ensure that it will be zero shitting, but you can minimize that shitting. If we minimize, maybe you can convince them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other comments not raised? So there was a good point there that uh, the traditional exam is costly anyway in terms of resources. So isn't there some more cost-effective ways to do it online, even if you have to have all this additional security? So that's a point. All right. Any other perspectives? I'm looking. I know ISED said... Uh, uh, Zabiba said she couldn't uh, talk, but she can she can hear us. We have uh, we have to have the exam system with the highest quality. Only then we will be able to change the paradigms of the education directorate at the very highest level. Because if we are not sure yet, it'll be more difficult to make them realize. We have to remember our responsibility in this process for being pioneers. Very nice. I like that attitude. All right, get your eggs in a row and then feel free to influence policy for the future. Nice. Any other perspectives that we need to raise? All right, I'm going to push on. Very interesting. I learned something from that discussion. So that was very useful. Thank you. Let me just put this down here. All right. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to argue, and Abiba gave me a nice segue into the next session. So what would you advise ministry in terms of a more appropriate uh, assess, summative assessment? <laughs> and um, I would say then you've got to push for authentic assessment. So uh, if, you, if you want to be uh, in the noble, in the, in the, uh, in the right, um, then you've got to be able to say that you are not just uh, exam mill churning out arbitrary papers, which everyone is trying to work out how to cheat and provide as little preparation as possible and to get the most marks out of. That demonstrates that it's not a particularly good way to determine how much learning has taken place. And that's our little picture here, our little thing. What we, what we are creating are graduates who are good at make, taking exams, all right? So we've got to kind of move on from there. Okay, so what is authentic assessment? So I would say then that uh, we need to measure the intellectual accomplishments of our graduates that are worthwhile. They are significant and they are meaningful. If you look at a lot of the questions in the exam, they are pretty low down on Bloom's taxonomy. They're down in the comprehension level, and some of them are really 
pointless. They're getting marks for memorizing vocabulary rather than full understanding of what it is that you're trying to teach them. And this should be contrasted to the multiple choice standardized tests that are so common. Authentic assessment tends to focus on contextualized tasks. So that means then that the students are taking the knowledge and the skills that you've trained them to do and then applying them to specific contexts. That's how you know that real learning has taken place. It enables students to demonstrate their competency in an authentic setting. Okay, so what should an exam look like? Well, really, it should be an opportunity for them to perform the skill sets that you've asked them to do. So maybe their statistical analysis. Maybe it is um, to teach a class in a specific way. Maybe it is um, ward work for a nurse. I mean, in the end, it's about not so much the knowledge, but what they do with the knowledge. Okay, so more a performance of that knowledge being used maybe as a skill, okay? Uh, demonstrating the use of knowledge, so demonstrating how it, how it can be applied. And then maybe developing, instead of a, uh, a pressurized exam, one uh, uh, high stress, this is the moment that justifies your whole year experience, rather build up a portfolio of work where they have demonstrated throughout the year at various different levels, what they have created in order to demonstrate that they can do the doing, all right? So if you were to compare authentic to traditional, so um, traditional would be true or false, select the right answer. Uh, what's wrong with this? So select a response versus performing a task. Traditional tends to be contrived. Sometimes the question itself is pretty trivial because it's contrived, it's some tiny, minute piece of almost inconsequential information. Whereas now we're trying to say it's more important how all of this uh, uh, relates to a real life experience. So if they're training to be accountants, can they do a little audit rather than understand the definition of a term, all right? Recall and recognition, that's Bloom tends to call that comprehension, whereas uh, authentic goes for construction and application. Bloom would call that creation, evaluation, um, uh, synthesis, etc. So Bloom's higher order thinking skills tend to be used in the authentic. Uh, traditional tends to be educator structured, whereas authentic tends to be student structured. Okay, um, we've mentioned that before in, in webinar two, we talked about student-centric approaches. And then traditional versus authentic, um, indirect evidence versus direct evidence. So that's why the idea of a portfolio would work because here is evidence that they can do the doing, whatever it might be. Okay, so that's, I would say you need to move your summative assessment into authentic, um, authentic assessment. Now, it's not like um, there's a, some lovely materials by this prof. Her name is Jan Harrington. And she's got a little video here. I'm not going to play it. We haven't got time. But uh, she explains how to very carefully select tasks for the assessment, which are authentic. And she takes you through a whole little process there of how to do it. All right. So the idea is... Um, Someone's thought it through. These, this is all well documented. Uh, just as we might have to train facilitators, uh, maybe we also need to train our academics to provide authentic assessment tasks. All right. So, and then we can take them through it like Jan Harrington's approach, which would be a step-by-step -step approach to do it. Uh, here are her nine steps on the right-hand side. Um, when you're teaching something, whether it's literature or whether it's teaching method or whether it's accountancy or whatever, you've got to position it within an authentic context. Okay, you don't teach it purely abstractly or conceptually. You have to teach it in an authentic context. Um, then the, when you provide them with things to do, those tasks must be authentic. They must be tied to the context. And ideally it should be a Mozambican context. So even if we're doing accounting, yes, 
Uh, we teach them all the principles of accounting, but then we also teach them what are the problems with doing accounting within northern Mozambique, for example. What, how, how do they now apply all these principles, etc.? Provide assess access to expert performances. So let them see someone doing it for real. So again, if we use our accountancy model, maybe we need to pull in people who are really, really doing book work and accounting in northern Mozambique, and they can go through what really does work in this environment, and what is the, the minimum level that has to be covered. Provide multiple roles and perspectives, um, give the kids all different things to do, support collaborative construction of knowledge. Uh, one of the problems, one of the critiques of the way we do traditional education is that we tend to force people to work individually because that's how we examine them. But the reality is they're not going to work like that. They tend to work collaboratively, and yet we don't really provide them with those skill sets uh, at all. So um, Harrington's kind of saying we should incorporate that in our design. Promote reflection to enable abstracts, abstractions to be formed. So they must keep thinking about what they're doing and what the implications are. Seven, promote articulation to enable tacit knowledge to be made explicit. I've forgotten what that is. <laughs> Provide. I can't remember. Sorry. Provide coaching and scaffolding by the teacher at critical times. All right. So the teacher, uh, like we were saying earlier, uh, uh, is a facilitator rather than a lecturer. Uh, Harrington uses the word coaching and that uh, you scaffold, which is something I was pushing for right at the beginning when we were talking about student centric things. So I agree with her on that. And then number nine is when we come to our summative assessment, that too needs to be authentic. We can't now lock them away into an exam hall and then ask them to remember the definitions of things that they know how to apply, but I can't remember the exact wording of the definition. The definition is unimportant if, it, if they have know how to apply the, the concept or the idea. So that's kind of her approach. I would say if you are going to tackle, once you have got past your COVID mandatory online exam thing where you're going to do all that, then you should start saying, well, really, assessment needs to be thought of right at the beginning. And it shouldn't necessarily lead to an exam. It should lead to evidence that they have acquired the competencies and skill sets and knowledge sets that they require in order to do the job properly. Okay. So I would say that would be one of the one of the approaches. Here she is. Let's just see if we can get a little bit of her going here. Just... Authentic assessment. I don't know if you can hear this. With the task. It also means that what you assess is generally a very polished kind of product. And usually that Okay, we won't go through it. Um, you need to decide as management who needs to think up the ISCED's policy on assessment and what are the key principles that you want to champion, all right? And maybe this could be one of them, the idea that we, you go for authentic assessment rather than the traditional exam, all right? Then I would say in module two, I went big on trying to encourage you guys to think very carefully about learning design and how all the pieces fit together. And so that when you create your courses, these quality courses, that people understand how all the bits fit together. And I try to get you to fill in a, a grid so that you were building a curriculum map, et cetera, et cetera. But here's kind of like a much simpler idea to understand where assessment fits into fits into the, um, the, the whole design. So assessment should really be seen as a key component of the design of your course design. So right at the beginning, you came up with what are your outcomes? What are you trying to achieve? And then we said, all right, now that you know what you're trying to get the students to do or know or, or do, then what are the activities that we need for them to get to those outcomes and now assessment is just another component to that so we would say well then how would we know that students have achieved the outcomes and therefore what you really need to do is start building very clear constructive alignment in your design process where assessment is authentic and 
it talks directly to what you said were your outcomes and links implicitly with all the different activities that are part of the course um, and so on. So I would say you should now go for authentic assessment and that you should be able to demonstrate that your course designs use constructive alignment. I'm going to play you a little clip because I think it's very good. I'm hoping you can hear this. Let me know if you can't. The design of a course consists of three main building blocks, the intended learning outcomes, the teaching and learning activities, and the assessment and feedback tasks. In a well-designed course, those building blocks should all be aligned with each other. They support each other and are geared towards each other. Biggs and Tang call this way of setting up a course constructive alignment. In a constructively aligned course, the building block, intended learning outcomes, is the central component. All the building blocks support each other, so the learner is enveloped within a supportive learning system. The intended learning outcomes are defined by Biggs and Tang as statements written from the student's perspective indicating the level of understanding and performance they are expected to achieve as a result of engaging in the teaching and learning experience. The intended learning outcomes give the course a sense of direction. They help with managing expectations of students and they help the teacher to determine which content should and should not be included. The intended learning outcomes should be formulated in such a way that they indicate which activities are more likely to help achieve these. Using action verbs is one way of achieving this. After defining the intended learning outcomes, engaging teaching and learning activities have to be selected. The action verbs formulated in the learning outcomes should be taken as a starting point in selecting the appropriate teaching and learning activities. Which activity will be the most likely to encourage the students to engage with these action verbs? After identifying the teaching and learning activities, appropriate assessment and feedback tasks have to be created. Assessment that corresponds to the formulated learning outcomes. Since constructive alignment is a dynamic process, it is also possible to start with creating assessment and feedback tasks before thinking about the teaching and learning activities. Three components of constructive alignment, the intended learning outcomes, the teaching and learning activities, and the assessment and feedback tasks are interrelated. Therefore, when revising one of them, revision of all of them is necessary. Okay, for those who know your education theory, apologies for having to go through something that is kind of key, but I just thought if we're going to talk about assessment, we mustn't see it in uh, isolation. It really needs to be part of module two, which was our, <laughs> and then uh, even our student activities as well. So um, I would say then that um, when we are arguing against the exam at uh, say to the ministry, then we should be able to demonstrate that to be honest, our summative assessment is much more scientific, that it is based on constructive alignment, that uh, they build a portfolio of evidence that they do something and it is not bound up in simple comprehension. It is really a demonstration that the students can do whatever it is we said were our outcomes or course objectives. So um, that's why I'm thinking, don't see assessment as something just tacked on at the end and it has to be this horrendous, um, stressful exam uh, uh, format, but rather good summative assessment would um, uh, be working at these higher levels. So if you look at the little diagram on the screen, for example, here's constructive alignment done up as columns, but I've put Bloom's taxonomy just behind. So you can see when we are doing an exam, the just because of the nature of where they're sitting, 
and uh, what tools they have available, we're more or less stuck in the bottom three. All right, we can do lots of remembering, some understanding, and a little bit of applying you can get in an exam situation. But then as you get towards these higher levels, it becomes very difficult to really measure to, to what extent a student is analyzing, evaluating, and creating, uh, because it's not the environment for that. And so therefore, with authentic assessments, it's saying we should be really positioning all our uh, assessment activities at that higher piece rather than the exam which focuses at those ones at the bottom of the Bloom's taxonomy. All right. Um, just to very quickly show you that this, uh, this thing works. Um, in the middle is our outcomes, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, really, we want to get as much of it in, uh, in block A, where the students are hypothesizing, they're creating, they're evaluating. Uh, then some activities in B, they must be able to analyze and apply in new contexts. C, they should be able to elaborate or explain. And then D is they must be able to comprehend or recite. We all know that D is pretty useless, okay? So we really want to be at the top end of that column, the blue column. And then our teaching and learning activities should be designed to get a, a, um, an array of activities that cover A, B, C, and D. But then so should our assessment in the third column, the pink column, um, we should be finding questions which line up with those A, B, C, and D. And that's why constructive alignment should be even part of um, our course design, but also our assessment design. So yeah, keep that, keep that in mind. All right. And that brings me to, um, um, oh, I did remember there were some questions earlier. Just before I sign off, yes, this one here. Um, when, when you guys came back from reporting in the breakout room, I realized I had flashed past um, something here. Some of you are saying that you are forced to try out for the COVID-19 season. You are going to have to do some traditional examinations online. So if you are interested in chasing up some of these proctoring software, there's a list of 14 of them. All right, uh, which um, are they any good? And that, should they be in that order? I have no idea. Um, I try my hardest not to go this route as you can pick up, but uh, there's 14 of them. Uh, Mercer and Metal tend to get a lot of exposure. I played a little bit with, oh, it's not on that list. I went for, I tried Talview just very briefly. Okay, but they're all much of a muchness. So uh, if you want to go that proctoring route, then there's some areas you can experiment with. Okay, all right, which brings me to the end of my formal presentation. And it's now open for questions. Are there any questions or comments or insight? What do people think of my, my big championing of authentic assessment and constructive alignment? Am I on a pipe dream? Uh, hello? Yes, who we got? Let me get my list up. I, 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 I jumped in because I didn't see anybody else talking. Excellent. Uh, you know, it, this is a personal opinion. Um, when it comes to examinations, uh, there's quite a lot that uh, we can learn from, from, from all of these and, and, and from experiences. Um, my view is that a lot of us are still having some serious challenges to even set up a very basic paper that will um, clearly and objectively assess a student learning. There's quite a lot of getting content material and then um, going back to the students and find out what is it that they memorized. 
what from what they have learned, from what they have read. And this for me is, is a huge challenge uh, for most of us, for our tutors, for our, our academic staff to prepare uh, even the, the, the traditional uh, basic kind of exam, mm. to set up exams, to mm. set up proper questions according to the objectives and the learning objectives and, and so forth. So I, I, I personally don't, don't like examinations. I don't like to write examinations. They're not exciting at all. And I don't like to give my students examinations. That's just my point of view. Thank you. I endorse your approach, but I think it's common throughout the developing world. We are locked into this obsession with centralized standardized exams and it is very damaging i think so i agree with you right other perspectives what do other people think it is hard to write what you're so used to doing comprehension activities for exams that it's actually quite difficult to write questions uh, which would uh, really uh, demonstrate that they can apply the information. Uh, yeah, we just don't get as many of those questions, which perhaps we could, but it's just people don't think, they just think of comprehension all the time. Okay, any other questions? Come, some hands. Let's hear what you guys think. Morning, everyone. Morning. Aviva here talking. Ah, we can hear you now. Good. Yes, I want to uh, to take another side for the problem of exams. In the tutor, I think the problem is not only uh, disability. I think another problem is the not engaging for the online uh, systems because sometimes the tutor entering in the middle bounds, but during the time with the experience, they have to improve. We don't have only to wait for a formal education. It's necessary to improve for uh, individual training and to engage, not only to wait and to, to I am in another problem in our country. I think it's necessary to think, to, to think for the ex excellence in the quality. Hmm. So the quality, uh, uh, the excellence is not, uh, is one ideal which all, all of, of us have to think about it and to, 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 to draw the program of the, co of the courses in the authentic form. Thank you. Right. Thank you. That was good. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm afraid it's an area we've got a lot of work to do in assessment. Assessment is, is an area begging for for change um but i like your 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 opinions uh right w what else we got any other perspectives on assessment all right in that case i'm going to show you your homework you're going to enjoy your homework this, this week. <laughs> right, let me just share my screen. Uh, here we go. All right, so what have we got? What have I set up for you for this week? All right, so we are now on week five, and uh, we've had a little introduction to online assessment strategies. Uh, we've had a big push for um, trying to get away from the traditional 
a, a summative assessment. We made a big case for um, a whole load of online uh, tools, particularly for uh, diagnostic and for formative assessment. So, um, yeah, if you want to have a look at the, uh, my presentation, I said there were some links in there and there was some proctoring uh, uh, links and there was Jan Harrington's video. I wouldn't mind you having a look at properly on authentic assessment tasks uh, and so on. Then you can look at the presentation. Here it is here. Give us a few hours and we'll get the Zoom recording up. If you want to just jump around the Zoom recording to find out what we were saying on the various slides, we're going to put it in here. But here's your work for um, the week. So what do I want you to do? So you're going to have a jaw. Okay. Um, when it comes to formative assessment, there's just tons of free little apps which just make testing so much fun. All right, so I've put up six things you can investigate. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six items. Cahoots. I gave you a demo of Cahoots when we were looking at uh, open licensing, remember? So um, I would like some of you to actually get together a little and put together a little Cahoot lesson for us. Uh, I don't want to know how to do it. I want you to um, give us a demonstration. So um, if you want, I can allocate you to teams, but I think... Ideally, you should do this on your own. You should experiment and try it out. So we've got Kahoot. You can click on the Kahoot page. I've put a whole load of little, um, uh, a little tutorial for you and the link to where you go and create your account. I want you to actually create one and we'll give you time next week to demonstrate what you've made. All right. So you can make us a Kahoot test is one. You could use Plickers. Plickers is a bit weird. Plickers is kind of like a blended learning approach. You use these cards, uh, the class holds the cards up, and then you use your phone, and then you, you use the video on the phone, and you just run your phone over them, and then it shows you who's got them right and who's got it wrong. <laughs> it's quite cool. It's like augmented reality. It's kind of weird. All right, but anyway, you can try it. Plickers, someone could, can you try Plickers? Um, Socrative, I mentioned in our presentation, it's um, that a formative assessment testing tool which gives you enormous diagnostic data bank. So I'd like someone to set up a little trial and try it out and let us know. Quizzes, I'd said, was the more serious Kahoots. So if you think Kahoots is a little bit too juvenile, then have a go at quizzes. And the model's slightly different. You don't do it together. It's a race to get through the whole test. So people pull ahead um, until they get to a question where they're stuck and then the others catch them up and so on. So it's a little bit, it's a bit different. Uh, and then I've got two which are not testing software. So you'll see there's Coggle. Coggle is concept mind mapping software. So I've got a picture of what it looks like in here. Now, remember, if we're going to go for authentic assessment, then um, we don't necessarily always want tests. We want them to be able to demonstrate something. So in this case here, you can use the software to um, actually uh, draw flow diagrams of the relationship between various elements. So uh, this is electrical systems, and then it branches out into these subsections and so on. This one's pretty straightforward, but you can get them to be quite complex and uh, cutting back on each other. So I would like someone to experiment with Coggle and let us know um, how you might use it for some type of authentic assessment, perhaps. And then the last one is Powtoons. Powtoons is an animation package. So um, you put together a little video clip and the idea is so your message becomes visual. So instead of yada, 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 like I've done a lot of today, um, you could actually put your key components in a little animation. And the idea is it's a free platform where you can pull little avatars and props and things onto your screen and you can add text or you can put voice over on top. So you basically make a little video uh, which has animation and you can either ask, uh, you can either create sections for your own presentation or you can ask students to actually use it to demonstrate 
understanding of some of your concepts. So I would like to understand how you might use this tool. All right, so we have six little free, they're all free. Well, there's free versions of them. Some of them you get more if you pay, but there's a free version of all of these. And I'd like you to play with the free version, uh, sign up for a little account, try them out. And in the next session, I am going to ask some people to present their Kahoot, Plickers, Coggle, Socrative, Quizzes, or Powtoon um, product. See what products you come up with. All right. So it's going to be a lot of playing this week. Uh, and why not? You might be managers. Hey, but life's got to be a bit of fun. Hey. So um, I'd like you to have uh, a go at that. And then I've asked, what role does formative assessment play in ISCED courses. So we talked about summative assessment in the breakout rooms today, but now I want you to think about formative assessment. All right. Is this something that should be emphasized? Is this something that we should do outside of Moodle with say things like these ones? Uh, and then can you capture your ideas in the forum? Now, um, we had discussed at the beginning of this presentation that I've been going through the forums and I'm noticing the same 15 people commenting in there. There are actually 32 of you. If you want to have the certificate saying that you were, have successfully completed this course, then you everyone needs to post once and reply twice to forum seven. All right, so if you want the certificate, there's gotta be evidence that you were in there and that you were engaging with the discussion, all right? Otherwise, no certificate. And it's a beautiful certificate. It's got gold and, and animations and straw. It's really, really, really good looking. You would want one for your wall. Make your wall look great, all right? So yes, can you please play a round of Kahoot? Anyone who presents next week immediately gets their certificate. And as I say, even if you don't present next week, I'm checking the forum seven to see who's still in the game and who's just lurking there in the background, thinking that if they sign up in Zoom, then that's enough. It's not. All right. Cool. All right. It is now half past 10. In fact, a few minutes past. So thank you very much, everyone. And that's the end of the synchronous session and the asynchronous session is about to start and you've got a week to get through these little assignments. Okay. Any final questions? Let me have a look at the chat. Where did that go? There it is. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, um, and this is not uh, outside our discussions here, but uh, I would like to hear about the role of peer assessment in, in distance education. Mm. Mm. All right. Um, it's, I'm a fan. I, I think peer assessment is, should definitely be part of your bouquet. Uh, for those who are not fully certain of what it is, it's where you ask students to mark each other's work. All right. Moodle has a plugin. I think it's called the workshop. workshop. And uh, so you have the technology already available. You would set an assignment and then you would get the students to actually mark each other. And the idea is they mark five. I think, I think you can set how many they mark. Um, so they don't mark all of them. They just mark five random ones. Uh, but besides using the memo to give them a mark, the, it's more important that they fill in their justification. Why have they given that mark? And it's very informative. And kids uh, and students are extremely insightful about the learning process. So I am a big fan of using peer assessment. I wouldn't use it as the only form of assessment, but I would say it's a very important component of your assessment strategy. So um, I'm a fan. Any other questions? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm going to sign off because we've had a long session today. 
we got going just on nine o'clock, so don't be late. I've said it before, a lot happens in that first 10 minutes. If you come wandering in later, then uh, you've already lost a good chunk. All right, good. I'm going to stop the recording and say thank you very much.